Good morning and welcome to the Cathedral Church of All Saints for this Sunday, the last Sunday in August. Today we're gathering to share in Eucharist and I'm joined by Reverend Helen for our service today. I do want to uh, let you know that in the coming weeks we will be opening our doors to have Eucharist here in the Cathedral. There will be a letter coming out to all the parish later this week. We've incorporated some new technology, so our services for the next little while at least will be here from the cathedral itself. This is in preparation for our diocesan synod, an electoral synod, that will take place on September the 12th here in the cathedral. Kind of a complex affair, but we will be having regional gatherings of electoral candidates around the province, 11 different locations that will all be tied in electronically to us here at the cathedral. And the proceedings for that day will be looked after by David Edwards, who is our new Archbishop and the Bishop of Fredericton. So I would ask you to continue to remember our diocese as we discern leadership for the way forward of our diocese and for those candidates who have offered themselves, Catherine Vaubenier, Carl Fraser, Sandra Fife, and Elliot Seitman. A few announcements as reminders. Again, the Labyrinth in Victoria Park on Sunday afternoons, 12.30 to 3.30. You can meet up with Heather, and she'll give you a little bit of the history and the theology behind a labyrinth and enable you and your family to have a walk through. We also want to remind you of meditation that takes place online Monday evenings, 6.30 to 7.30. No experience necessary. You can learn about uh, Christian meditation and take part in some of that learning and practice. You just need to have the link to connect to the event. So if you would send an email to prayasyoucan3 at gmail.com. And the rest of the information will be passed along to you. I also want to remind you on behalf of our Primates World Relief and Development Fund contact, Chris, that there is a webinar coming up September the 1st at 2 o'clock Atlantic time. And you can register for that by going to the Primates Fund website and finding information. The webinar is on food aid, food security, and food sovereignty. So as we begin our service this morning, a reminder that you will find today's service, as always, online. Go to the Cathedral Church of All Saints website. Under the Information tab, click Newsletters and Bulletins, and you will find today's service. As we open, we begin with the hymn, Take Up Your Cross, the Savior Said. Thank you. 
And I welcome any young people who are watching us this morning. That hymn, Take Up Your Cross, is really kind of an invitation and also a theme for today. So I want to just ask you, have you ever taken part in any kind of a sporting event, maybe a race or maybe a walkathon? Many of you I know have taken place over the years in the Blue Nose Marathon, which because of the pandemic was canceled this year. They had hoped it might take place again in November, but that's not going to happen either. But when you sign up for something like that, one of the things that often happens is that they give you a number. And this is a number from an event I took place in last year. And that number does two things. It identifies who you are, but it also, it also is an invitation to take part in whatever that event is. But the invitation comes with a challenge. If you're invited to take part in something like a road race or a walkathon, you make a commitment to see it through to the end, because that's what it's all about. It's about taking that extra effort, offering yourself to do something that may be challenging and hard, but also comes with some great rewards. Often those kinds of events raise money for charities or for other causes that are important to us as a community. So you get the number, you get your invitation, and you commit yourselves to th see it through, not to give up. And one of the neat things that happens is quite often, if you've made it to the end, if you've carried out whatever the task is, you end up with a nifty shirt as well. This is a shirt that I got uh, earlier this summer, and uh, I want to say thank you to Harry for the opportunity to be a part of the event that got me this shirt. But that's also partly what I want to uh, tell you about this morning. I want to tell you the story of a young woman. And this young girl's name is Mandy. And Mandy can remember learning how to sing when she was as young as four years old. And it was her love for singing and music that eventually took her to university to study music. Her dream in life was to be a music teacher. But then, unfortunately, she got sick. And at the age of 18, she lost her hearing. She became deaf. And she remembers that day being in a classroom for a music exam. And the teacher was going to play some music, and the students were to write down what the music said to them. She picked up her pen and waited, but didn't hear anything. And then noticed that her classmates were busily taking notes. That's when she realized how profound her deafness had become. And she tells in her story of that experience, she said, when I lost my hearing, I gave up. But I wanted to do more with my life than just give up. Well, she didn't give up. Even though it was challenging and even though it was difficult to learn to sing when she could no longer hear or hear the people accompanying her in her music, with electronic visual tuners and with the memory of the music still inside her head and her heart, she learned how to sing again. And you can hear her amazing story. I don't usually uh, um, kind of promote these, but if you look up the name, Mandy Harvey, America's Got Talent, you will see her story and hear this remarkable woman who, despite the challenge, would not give up and has learned to sing and is now enjoying a professional singing career. So not unlike when we become baptized, become Christians, we make a commitment not to give up. Amen. Thank you, Dean Paul, for that story. And I invite you to join with me in worship and prayer and praise. If you do not have the booklet printed uh, for this morning, you can use your book of alternative services by turning to page 185. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. 
Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. O God, whose word burns like a fire within us, grant us a bold and faithful spirit, so that in your strength we may be unafraid to speak your word and follow where you lead. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, for ever and ever. Amen. And please now listen to the Holy Scripture. Our first reading this morning is from the book of Exodus. We read from the third chapter beginning at the 15th, at the first verse. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then God said, Come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said, Further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt, I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is my title for all generations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, to God. be to God. Our psalm is number 105, and we're reading portions of it, and it's responsive, so if you have your prayer book, you may join in at home. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. 
to him, sing praises to him, and speak of all his marvelous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Search for the Lord and his strength. Continually seek his face. Remember the marvels he has done, his wonders, and the judgments of his mouth. O offspring of Abraham, his servant, O children of Jacob, his chosen. Israel came into Egypt, and Jacob became a sojourner in the land of Ham. The Lord made his people exceedingly fruitful. He made them stronger than their enemies, whose heart he turned so that they hated his people and dealt unjustly with his servants. He sent Moses, his servant, and Aaron, whom he had chosen, that they might keep his statutes and observe his laws. Alleluia. Let us pray. God of our salvation, through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you have fulfilled your promise to our ancestors in the faith to redeem the world from slavery and to lead us into the promised land. Grant us living water from the rock and bread from heaven that we may survive our desert pilgrimage and praise you forever through Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen. Our epistle is written in the letter of Paul to the Romans, the 12th chapter, beginning at the 9th verse. Paul writes, Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing on, do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. But take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, to God. be to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, that this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In 
And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. This morning's gospel, which we just heard Helen proclaim, can best be understood if we place it alongside last week's gospel, I think. In fact, if we place it in the context of the unfolding drama that the Gospel of Matthew has presented to us throughout this summer. Last week, if you tuned in here and saw Ray give his sermon, it was the incident of Jesus putting a question to his disciples. Two questions, really. And the first was, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And then the more pointed, personal question, but who do you say that I am? And as if the penny was finally dropped, Peter steps forward and boldly proclaims, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. It's the first time that the disciples have articulated what must have been a deep, growing awareness of who their spiritual companion and guide was this gifted preacher, teacher, and healer from Nazareth was indeed the long-awaited Messiah. And if Peter has any doubts or hesitations in making such a bold statement, his fears were swept aside when Jesus commends him. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter the rock, and and on this rock I will build my church. Imagine how proud Peter must have been. He's just been elevated to the head of the class. He got it right. Now it's important to keep in mind the cultural and historic context in the background here to fully appreciate what Peter's statement meant and what happens today. Our first reading this morning from the book of Exodus tells the story of the calling of Moses. Moses, who was adopted into the household of the reigning pharaoh of Egypt after being rescued as a baby from the Nile River by the pharaoh's own daughter, has gone into a life of self-imposed exile in the wilderness. He who once lived a life of privilege and power now tends sheep. All this came to pass when Moses discovered his true identity as a Hebrew. The Hebrews were a nation enslaved and forced into hard labor to build the cities of Pharaoh. In a moment of passionate justice, Moses comes to the aid of a Hebrew worker who has been beaten by an Egyptian authority. Moses kills the Egyptian soldier, hides his body in the sand, and decides he better leave town before Pharaoh learns of his crime. It is to this man that God appears. God calls Moses out of hiding to lead his people out of their bondage into freedom, to set their feet on a path to new life. I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt, God says to Moses. I have heard their cry, I know their suffering, and I have come to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land a land flowing with milk and honey. And Moses, much to his own surprise and reluctance, he simply didn't see himself as the liberating leader type that God had in mind. He is amazed that God would choose him for this task. Well, generations have now passed. The Hebrews had journeyed over many years and through many joys and sorrows to establish themselves as the nation of Israel. The land promised to them by God through Moses had become a reality. But their story, their history reminds us that we don't just live for the promise. Years of prosperity gave rise to years of self-satisfaction and self-centeredness. Time and again, God became an afterthought to them. Years of prosperity gave rise to years of division, political turmoil, invasions from neighboring countries, exiles once again, confusion, hardship. 
They live now as captives in their own land under the rule of the powerful Roman Empire. But they weren't prepared to just give up. Someday they dreamed God would once again raise up from among them a new liberator, a new Moses, a Messiah, who would reestablish the glory days, drive out the enemy, and restore God's rule. Now do you see why this declaration and affirmation of Peter is so significant? He, this man Jesus, is the one. But that moment of euphoria and excitement that follows that shining light of revelation quickly begins to tarnish and dim. No sooner does Jesus praise Peter and claim that with his faith they will build a church, a living community of people embodying his mission and message, than he also turns to them and says, don't tell anyone about this. Why did he say that? And that brings us to this rather disturbing gospel for this morning. Jesus now begins to shake their newfound hope and faith by dispelling their vision of a liberating, conquering Messiah. He now describes how he must go to Jerusalem, undergo great suffering at the hands of not just the political leaders of the day, but by Israel's own religious leaders, the scribes and Pharisees. And he tells them he will be put to death. You can understand Peter's confusion and anger. Jesus brings them to the mountaintop only to push them over the edge. If any want to become my followers, Jesus now cautions, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. There is a beautiful prayer that can be used in our Anglican marriage liturgy at the conclusion of a marriage service, which contains a rather curious line in the prayer. We thank you for making the way of the cross to be the way of life. It is something of a reality check in the midst of a service of joy and celebration. It reminds us, reminds those just recently married, that wedded bliss eventually meets the hard road of reality, the everyday and the ordinary, a prompting that relationships, any relationships, to endure and grow require work and effort and sacrifice. These things don't just happen, but it is in and through the challenge that we are strengthened. The disciples did not fully understand the concept of discipleship when they signed on, when Jesus first extended the invitation to come and follow me. Now, even though Jesus clearly states what lies ahead for him, and ultimately for them, they still fail to understand. Jesus has told them that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. The same Peter who was praised last week is now uncharacteristically berated. Jesus calls Peter Satan and tells him, get behind me. It is reminiscent of Jesus' confrontation with temptation in the wilderness at the very beginning of his ministry. Both then and here in this moment is the temptation to take the easy road, to avoid the conflict, to use his power and authority to achieve his own end. The disciples were slow to understand the way of the cross. Is it any wonder if we find it hard to grasp and embrace such a notion? Let me also point out that Jesus doesn't say that if anyone wants to be a follower of mine, they must take up my cross. He says, take up your cross. Jesus isn't saying you have to embrace martyrdom, but he is saying that all of us will face personal challenges and mountains. We have to be prepared to do more than just give up. Spiritual growth takes place slowly and sometimes painfully, but there is also joy in the challenge and struggle. It's not all doom and gloom here. 
Recall earlier in the Gospel of Matthew when John the Baptist is discouraged that change isn't coming as fast as he had hoped, and he begins to doubt if Jesus is indeed the long-awaited Messiah. So he sends his disciples to ask Jesus, and Jesus says to them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them, and blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. Some of you may recall the Canadian political leader Jack Layton, who died nine years ago this month. Just days before his death, he wrote an open letter to the Canadian people in which he said, Love is better than anger. Hope is better than fear. Optimism is better than despair. So let us be loving, hopeful, and optimistic, and we'll change the world. As Jesus is trying to impress upon his disciples this morning, we don't change the world by succumbing to the ways of the world, but by having the courage to stand at the edge, point to the distant horizon, and begin the journey. That's Jesus' point. This weekend in Washington, D.C., thousands of people gathered as part of a planned rally and march organized by the Reverend Al Sharpton on the 57th anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s March on Washington that had taken place August 28, 1963. The marchers and the lineup of speakers demanded racial justice and police reforms following the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis and the recent shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Fifty-seven years later, Dr. King's 12-year-old granddaughter, Yolanda, stood before the thousands gathered at the very same place, the Lincoln Memorial, where her grandfather gave his impassioned and defining I Have a Dream speech. Like her grandfather before her, young Yolanda Renee King, barely tall enough to be seen above the podium, eloquently urged a new generation, her own generation, to continue in that peaceful demonstration against systematic racism and to dream of a new tomorrow. My generation has already taken to the streets, she said, peacefully and with masks and social distancing to protest racism. She went on to say, and I want to ask the young people here to join me in pledging that we have only just begun to fight and that we will be the generation that moves from me to we. Great challenges produce great generations, she said. We have to do more than just give up. Let me leave you as a further reflection on today's readings and teaching those chilling prophetic words from Dr. King's last public speech, April 3, 1968, in which he said, well, I don't know what will happen tomorrow. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't really matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we, as a people, we'll get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. May God bless us in the challenge of taking up our cross and following in the footsteps of the Prince of Peace. Amen.
We have listened to the reading of Holy Scripture, and we've listened to a meditation on God's Word. So let us now confess the faith of our baptism as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In offering prayers this morning, I will be using the litany from our Book of Alternative Services at page 116, litany seven, page 116. Let us pray in faith to God our Father, to his Son, Jesus Christ, and to the Holy Spirit, saying, Lord, hear and have mercy. For the Church of the Living God throughout the world, remembering especially this diocese at this time, as we prepare ourselves to elect a new bishop, we pray for both the discernment of those who will be casting votes and the discernment of those who have offered themselves. We also pray for the Church at this time of challenge as we find ways to continue to connect, inspire, and celebrate our lives during this pandemic. Let us ask the riches of God's grace. Lord, Lord hear, hear and, and have, have mercy. mercy. For all who proclaim the word of truth, let us ask the infinite wisdom of Christ. Lord, hear, hear and, and have, have mercy. mercy. To all who have consecrated their lives to the kingdom of God, and for all struggling to follow the way of Christ, let us ask the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Lord, Lord hear, hear and, and have, have mercy. mercy. For Elizabeth, our Queen, for the Prime Minister of this country, and for the leaders of the nations around the world, that they may strive for justice and peace. Let us ask the strength of God. Lord, Lord hear, hear and, and have, have mercy. mercy. We pray for scholars and research workers, particularly those who have turned their focus to battling the coronavirus. We pray for all those seeking medical treatment and care, that their studies may benefit all of humanity, we remember this morning those who have asked us to remember them in prayer and those that we remember in our own hearts and minds as we gather at a distance this morning. This community has been asked to remember in prayer Shirley, Connie, Douglas, Ian, Kara, George, Pat and family, Dennis, Shelley, Leland, Joan, Marion, Keegan, Susan, Nadine, Suzanne, Pam, Don Marie, Lara, Mary, Nicole, Freya, Barry, Alex, Kathy, Joanne, Paula, Nadia and family, Beryl, Jack, the Adams, David, Bruce, Chris, Gordon, Brian, Geraldine, Evander and family, Andrew, Lois, Devon, Glenn, Charles, Diane, Robin, Gert, 
Sharon, and Harry, Adam, Alexis, and Elise. We remember also those who have faced the power of Hurricane Laura, but those involved in rescue and cleanup work. Let us ask the healing and light of the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear and, and have, have mercy. mercy. For all who have passed from this life in faith and obedience, remembering Chadwick Bosman, let us ask the peace of Christ. Lord, hear and have mercy. And have mercy. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. He welcomes sinners and invites us to this table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
merciful God, receive all we offer you this day. Give us grace to love one another, that your love may be made perfect in us. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. For those of you who do not have the bulletin at home, we are using Eucharistic prayer number one. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right that we should praise you, gracious God, for you created all things. You formed us in your own image. When we turned away from you in sin, you did not cease to care for us, but opened a path of salvation for all people. You made a covenant with Israel, and through your servants Abraham and Sarah, gave the promise of a blessing to all nations. Through Moses, you led your people from bondage into freedom. Through the prophets, you renewed your promise of salvation. Therefore, with them and with all your saints, who have served you in every age, we give thanks and raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy God, source of life and goodness, all creation rightly gives you praise. In the fullness of time, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He healed the sick and ate and drank with outcasts and sinners. He opened the eyes of the blind and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and to those in need. In all things, he fulfilled your gracious will. On the night he freely gave himself to death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. <clears throat> this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Gracious God, his perfect sacrifice destroys the power of sin and death. By raising him to life, you give us life forevermore. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Recalling his death, proclaiming his resurrection, and looking for his coming again in glory, we offer you, Father, this bread and this cup. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts, that all who eat and drink at this table may be one body and one holy people, a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord, through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I am the bread of life, says the Lord. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. 
Whoever believes in me will never thirst. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are they who trust in him. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. And I acknowledge, Jean, that there are just two of us here in the cathedral and many of you at home joining in. Let us have a, a prayer for spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. I desire to offer you praise and thanksgiving as I proclaim your resurrection. I love you above all things and long for you in my soul. Since I cannot now receive you in the sacrament of your body and blood, at least come spiritually into my heart. Cleanse and strengthen me with your grace, Lord Jesus, and let me never be separated from you. May I live in you and you in me in this life and in the life to come. Amen. Almighty God, you renew us at your table with the bread of life. May your holy food strengthen us in love and help us to serve you and each other. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we could ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. And as we go about our daily work and whatever we're going to do after this service, may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and all who you love this day and forever. Amen.
let us go forth in peace in the name of the Lord.